you may not think much about earthworms. So it might surprise you to learn that there are 7,000 species of them. They play many roles in the ecosystem from improving soil fertility to accelerating the nutrient cycle in soil plant systems and providing food to fish, birds, and even humans. They're also ideal specimens for teaching simple anatomy systems, which is why many biology classes dissect them. But today we're gonna spare our wormy friends and conduct a virtual dissection using Visible Biology's 3D earthworm model. You won't need a scalpel or gloves for this, and it's gonna be a heck of a lot less stinky, but you can use the Visible Biology Lab activity to follow along and keep track of all the anatomy we cover in this video. Let's start with the outermost part of the earthworm, which is called the cuticle. The cuticle is a waxy layer composed of collagen fibers that protect the epidermis and keep the worm from drying out. The cuticle also helps cut down on the friction as the worm moves through various environments. But the cuticle isn't perfect. It can't withstand hot temperatures, which is why sometimes you see dried out worms on the sidewalk on hot days. Because worms breathe through their skin, a moist surface is necessary for oxygen to be absorbed and carbon dioxide to be given off. To keep this skin moist, the cuticle is covered by mucus, which you've certainly felt if you've ever picked up a worm. If the worm's cuticle gets dried up by the sun, it will die because this exchange of gases just can't occur anymore. Spoiler alert, the same thing happens in frogs, which we will cover in another video. So you may be asking yourself, why doesn't an earthworm just stay underground when it rains instead of coming to the surface? Not a bad idea, it would definitely stay moist. Scientists aren't exactly sure of the answer. Some think too much water is a bad thing because the water takes the place of valuable air in the soil. Let's dissect away the cuticle. Here we have the epidermis, or skin, which is used for breathing and protection. Like your skin, it's going to help keep the worms insides inside and the outsides outside. You may notice that there's a raised portion here. It's called the clitellum, which is actually part of its reproductive system. We'll get to that a little later on. Now, Wormy needs to be able to move through its environment. These little projections it has are called seti, and they help the earthworm push through the soil. I like to think of the way this works like Vikings rowing a ship. Those little structures don't look like they would do much, but when they all move together, they're capable of covering a lot of ground. The seti aren't just for movement. They can also be used to anchor the worm in place, keeping it safe from predators. Worms find this pretty handy. When we look at the worm, we see it has ridges, kind of like a potato chip, but way less tasty. This is because the worm is segmented. Segmentation is nature's cut and paste. We can think of a segment as a self-contained unit. Then when nature makes an animal bigger, it cuts and pastes over and over. One of the cool things this allows for is specialization because when you have a spare segment, you can trick it out with reckless abandon knowing if you really mess up, you have a backup. Let's dissect away the epidermis, which brings us to the worm's musculature. The worm's muscles come in two flavors, longitudinal and ranch. I mean circular, longitudinal and circular. Since each segment is somewhat independent, the muscles within the segment are as well. When the worm is moving, the circular muscles will contract while the longitudinal muscles relax, making the segment long and thin. Then the reverse happens. The circular muscles relax and the longitudinal muscles contract, making the segment shorter. Watch this segment. When we look at the worm moving, we can see that this happens from front to back. See what I mean? When we remove these muscles, we see the septa, which divide the segments. But how do these muscles know when to be active or how to coordinate their contractions? They use the nervous system. This is on the ventral side, the fancy name for tummy. This may seem strange because your nervous system is on your dorsal side. So why is theirs on the ventral side? Well, during development, their mouth develops before their anus, which means they're classified as protostomes. Protostomes include most invertebrates. Knowing your nerve cord is on the opposite side, you can guess how you started in life. Back to the worm. See that bulge in the nerve cord? 
This is called a ganglion, and it's a small collection of neurons that's mostly concerned with controlling that segment. It's like its very own mini brain. While we're looking at the nervous system, I wanna look at one of those specializations I talked about before. Let's move way up to the front of the worm. Here, you see a much larger chunk of nervous tissue. This is like the one brain to rule them all. It is able to coordinate all those mini brains and keep them in line. Why does it happen in the front? Well, because the worm moves in that direction, a lot of its sensory structures are up on its head, which makes it a convenient place to put its main brain. So let's look closer at the brain using some histological images. These are some photos I took of leech brains, but they're pretty similar to what you would see in an earthworm. If you look at the bottom of the brain, you can see dark green dots. Those are cells. Note that those cells are in clusters. Those clusters basically represent some mini brains that mashed together to become a bigger brain that was capable of more things. You might notice this hole in the middle of the brain. Remember how we said the mouth develops first? Well, the stomach is on the opposite side of the worm from the nervous system and it needs to connect to the mouth. This results in the esophagus having to go through the middle of the main brain. I guess we know what's on their mind. All joking aside, this separates the brain into two regions, one above the digestive tract and one below. In the worm, these are called the cerebral ganglion and the subpharyngeal ganglion. All right, now back to the segments. In addition to the mini brain, the muscles need fuel. This is where the blood comes in. The worm's circulatory system is pretty simple. It's Basically some tubes that use pumps to move blood around. The pumps are these five aortic arches. These are just tubes that squeeze. They may not seem fancy, but these sorts of pumps are plenty effective for a small critter. The aortic arches move blood through blood vessels. We can see the two main blood vessels here named creatively the dorsal and ventral vessels. These carry blood the length of the worm, allowing it to flow into smaller vessels, making sure the nutrients get to all the cells that need them. But how do we get those nutrients in the blood? Worms get nutrients from their food, which is dead and decaying stuff in the soil. Mmm, just like mom used to make. They have a simple digestive system. It's basically just another tube, but some regions are a little specialized. Let's take a look at each of those. Food enters the mouth and gets swallowed by the pharynx. The pharynx secretes mucus and protein digesting enzymes onto the material. This mix passes through the esophagus. Unlike the human esophagus, this one has glands that secrete calcium carbonate to neutralize any acids coming down the pipes. And because the earthworm doesn't have bones, this rids its body of any excess calcium. From here, it moves into a storage structure called the crop. Eventually, it moves to the gizzard, which, similar to gizzards and other animals, such as birds, uses stones to grind the food into smaller bits. Remember, these guys don't have teeth, and smaller bits have more surface area for enzymes to interact with. The gizzard also introduces some enzymes that further break down these noms into nutrients. Finally, the material reaches the intestine. The intestine secretes more enzymes and contains bacteria that continue this enzymatic breakdown of food. Their intestine, like ours, is very long. It's almost the length of the worm itself, and it continually absorbs nutrients. Anything that's not absorbed exits through the anus. But this isn't the only way to get rid of stuff the worm's body does not want. Each segment is gonna have a minimum of 40 or 50 structures called nephridia. These nephridia are kind of like nephrons, which are the functional unit of human kidneys. Nephridia will control water and ion balance, keeping the good stuff in the system and getting rid of the bad stuff, such as nitrogenous wastes like ammonia and urea. Since these can be toxic when they build up in the body, they get secreted out of little pores. Last but not least, we have the reproductive structures. Worms are hermaphrodites, meaning they have both male and female sex organs. If you know, you know. But they reproduce sexually through external fertilization. Two mating worms will align their bodies in opposite directions to exchange sperm. 
In the male reproductive system, immature sperm called spermatogonia are produced in the testes and move to testes sacs. From here, the cells move into seminal vesicles where they continue to mature into spermatozoa. During reproduction, the sperm ducts transport the mature sperm from the vesicles to the male genital pores at the 15th segment where they're released. Meanwhile, in the female reproductive system, in the 9th and 10th segments, there are seminal receptacles, which is where the sperm are stored until we're ready to make those zygotes. A pair of ovaries are located in the 13th segment on either side of the ventral nerve cord, and these produce the eggs, which are transported via oviducts to the 14th segment where the female genital pore is. So let's bring it all together at the clitellum. Do you remember that from earlier? It secretes mucus that hardens into a cocoon and acts as a protective capsule for the worm's zygotes. The cocoon will move up the body to the head where it will receive eggs and sperm from their various repositories forming these zygotes. Then the cocoon will be deposited into the soil and more wormies will eventually be born. Fun fact, despite having both male and female reproductive systems, worms cannot self-fertilize their eggs with their own sperm. Bummer. This concludes our virtual dissection of the earthworm. Be sure to check out the lab activity and resources in the description below. And you don't have to stop with the earthworm. We have three other dissectable models in visible biology, a sea star, a frog, and a pig. With the animal structure and function unit, you can compare invertebrate and vertebrate body systems and see how evolution shaped anatomy. Yeah.